My name is Faye Davis, and I am the Assistant Director of Sustainability for Outreach and Engagement. But I, I'd like to introduce our first speaker today. Um, I know when he walked in, and I spoke with him on the phone yesterday, I was starstruck. Like, he's just so charismatic, and um, I, I really hope you enjoy his message. Um, so, uh, Shutescott Martinez. Um, environmental activist is here today to share um, his story. Tonati no chime, ni mesla paloa na no toka shiu teskat tonatiu no masewal po wayan ewa Santa Cruz Acalpisca Mexico Xochimilco Mexico. Good morning, everybody. How's everyone feeling? Sorry, it's okay. So it's it's my first time back in front of a live audience too. So you know. Um, yeah, it's crazy. I used to do this stuff all the time back before the whole pandemic. Um, and I've done plenty of these on Zoom, but it feels good to be in person. It's good to be here with the, some, you know, see people nod. Like, I have really bad eyesight, and I'm not wearing my glasses right now. But I, can st I, I get the vibes. I hear y'all. Um, so grateful to be here. And um, thank you to the organizers. Thank you to the people that have kind of opened up the space for us to, to be able to be here, to Dallas College, to the Sustainability Summit. Um, just take a second too to acknowledge uh, the traditional territories of, of the Kikupu, Kikupu people um, and a handful of different tribes that have had kind of long histories that predate this college, that predate America as a concept it's itself. Um, and I think it's important to ground ourselves in an understanding of, of, of place, of spatiality, of, of where it is that we are, whose land we are, we are taking up space upon. Um, and I think the, uh, the foundation of, of the work that we uh, can do together in the space of sustainability and in the hopes to build a brighter and more just and regenerative future begins with that foundational relationship to land. And I think the climate crisis itself is an expression and a result of a very dysfunctional relationship with the land. It's a continuation of the last 500 years of, of, of colonial violence that has been perpetuated uh, first by the genocide and removal of the first peoples of these lands and the enslavement of our African relatives that were brought over here, continued with the extractive industries that to this day predominantly affect black, brown, and indigenous communities. Every step of, of, of the harms that are created by the climate crisis are still to this day um, disproportionately impacting our peoples and our communities. And so I think, you know, those conversations are so intertwined. And that's part of what I, I, I'm, I'm here to share with you all and I hope to, to leave you with is this understanding that although the stories that we have been told about the climate and about environmental issues oftentimes feel linear or limited or um, it's actually a lot more connected than we oftentimes taught. So I'm going to just uh, cue the next slide when you get a chance. Thank you. Um, well, I think the first slide. This might be at the end. Appreciate that. Um, so I so I guess um, my introduction is in is in my language Nahuatl, and my people are the Xochimilca people of a uh, community in Mexico called Santa Cruz Acalpisca. It's the land of my ancestors, of my great grandmother, the matriarch of our family, who recently passed us this last year, and um, everything I I do stems from that relationship to that land in Mexico. Uh, I, I was born here in the States. I was born in Boulder, Colorado, not too far from here. Um, and for me, all of the work that I've done in the last many years has been a result of a very alternative upbringing, I think you could say. Um, and I owe a lot to my parents. I owe a lot to my family. I owe a lot to my community. And from a very early age, uh, this is a photo of my father, my grandfather and I in Mexico and, and our family's home that we still um, live in my family out there still lives into this day and every step of I think my formation around my understanding of the climate crisis my understanding of the intersections of social climate justice of indigenous sovereignty and climate justice really stem from these conversations I had like at this well we're not at this age but a little bit older right as I was forming my understanding of the world around me I was as I was forming a, a, an understanding and a sense of self so many of the teachings that I was blessed enough to receive from my father, from my grandmother, my grandfather, were based in this deep belief in, in our interconnectedness. 
And my dad, he grew up, you know, in, in a, a pretty kind of in, in poverty in Mexico, you know, in a very poor uh, family, poor community with um, not a lot of material needs or abundance being met. You know, not a, not a lot of the material needs being met. Uh, to this day, still, we get running water down there like once or twice a week. And when you get the running water, you have to go and fill up every, these huge, like, big barrels full of water so that you can use that throughout the week to wash your hair, to wash your dishes, to wash your clothes, to flush the toilet. Everything is, is you know, based on that relationship with water. It was very scarce. Um, and I think that lack of having the material abundance that many people grow up with gives you a really special relationship with really simple things. I think that combined with a lot of the indigenous teachings that were passed down from my great-grandmother that were rescued slowly um, by the last couple of generations of my family instilled this understanding of interconnectedness. And my dad and I remember walking through Colorado where I grew up and, and back and forth when I would visit Mexico and go back home. The smallest things that my dad would point out and be like, that is sacred are when it rained outside when there was little ants walking along the path with us like all these really simple like seemingly trivial things the wind the water the elements um being in the forest connecting with the forest and with the land like all of these relationships shaped my understanding of it's not just about us as human beings we are deeply interconnected with everything around us and that understanding and that way of life is something that I, as I grew up and as I started to go to school and interact with other students, other people my age, I was like, whoa, not everyone thinks this way. Not everyone is, is educated this way. And I, and I realized how much of a privilege it was to grow up with pieces of my language, with pieces of my connection to my family ceremonies, with pieces of my connection to my culture, to have the name that I have. Um, that's because of generations of, of resistance to the erasure of our peoples, to pass down these small things that may feel trivial or may feel minuscule in the, grand, in the grander scheme, right? But those very things are, are, have shaped my entire reality. Go well, next. And on top of that, predating my, my existence on this planet, my birth, um, back in way back, especially for you youngins, this is like a long, long time ago, back in the year 1992, um, I, this is way before I was around. My mother, which was another important source of uh, inspiration and guidance and wisdom in my life, she looked around at her community and realized there, there's not spaces that advocate for and empower young people to use their voice. I don't see that in my community. So when my mom said, like, okay, my mom also comes from a very very complicated and crazy background as well. Um, and she's writing her book right now, so I'm excited for, for the world to get to experience some of that, that wonder and that magic. But what she decided to do is she founded a, a high school in Maui, Hawaii in 1992, and they named it the Earth Guardian School. And there were 70 students and nine teachers. It was a high school, an accredited high school. It's very small. And they traveled around the islands, and everything in their curriculum was based around youth empowerment, environmental sustainability, and creating an educational platform that invested in young people finding and using our voice to affect change in our community. And it wasn't just academically focused, and it wasn't just, you know, following along with some of the maybe stereotypes we have in our mind of what activism can look like or what student activism can look like. Um, they did write letters to senators and they did plant, you know, 10,000 sandalwood trees on the island. Uh, they did a lot of that kind of stuff, flat beach cleanups, but they're also all performers. Like all of my older siblings and cousins and aunties and uncles who were involved in the school, we were really encouraged to express ourselves creatively and musically as a way to resist and as a way to share our story and share our message. And I grew up watching old VHS tapes of this tour, of this tour that they did. After my mom founded this school, they brought a handful of the students on the school bus and traveled to do events in 29 states across the U.S., from California to New York. And everywhere they would go, they would give presentations, not unlike the one I'm giving now. And they would teach and educate. And, and this is all before social media. 
This is all before, you know, this, the era of digital activism that we exist in today. And it was all about community and the relationships that we built with people on the ground and the way that we could demonstrate that these students, these kids are not unlike the students that attend this college or the students that are in the audience or it's happening on Zoom. You know, that these are like regular high school kids who have a deep belief that there is something more beautiful and more just than the world that we see around us. And we're, we're here to play our part, to be a part of shaping that. And so that's like, that's the context. That's, I was raised watching those videos, those old VHS tapes of their performances and of their, of their speeches. And it, it had taught me a couple things, right? First of all, many of us, when we, as in the mind of a child, right? When I was a little kid, first learning about the climate crisis, first watching some of these documentaries, first having these conversations with my parents, with my peers. A lot of us as children, we see something wrong in the world. We see something unjust. We see something to, that we believe to be unfair or wrong. And in the mind of a child, you're like, well, why don't we fix it? Why don't we just stop destroying the planet, exploiting communities to extract fossil fuels? Why don't we just, you know, not <laughs> ruin the future for next generations? Um, but there isn't always the, the, the environment or the platform or the space is offered to young people to take that imagination of a world that is different than what we see around us and make it a reality. And that's, I think, the only like, real difference between me and a lot of other young people is that from a very early age, I had these role models and these examples. And what I learned from Earth Guardians, from the school that my mom started that became this worldwide organization working with thousands of young people across the globe, I didn't have that same kind of like limitation or that barrier between seeing something and feeling emotionally about it and saying like, I want to do something. And what seems to be a very big leap for many people in, in doing that thing or speaking out or using your voice. And that's also one of the huge privileges that I've carried throughout my life is having a supportive family and system around me and to help cultivate this understanding of what it means to use our voice, what it means to lead, what it means to play a part in shaping our future. So from there, I go to the next slide. So much of, you know, how I moved through the world was based on this, this belief and this lack of limitations of understanding that my voice had something that I had something that I wanted to say. And I was very, you know, set on helping build this for my generation. Knowing that the support system that I received gave me the power to step into my light. Reminded me that for all the young people out there that don't have those things, that don't have that community, that don't have that support, that don't have those resources, those role models. I spent the last, you know, 16-ish years trying to fix that and trying to understand that, you know, this existential crisis that is the climate crisis the environmental degradation and devastation, the, the intersections of, of racial and social justice with this, the environmental catastrophes that we're seeing in the world and in our communities. We need young people at the forefront of these conversations, at the forefront of these movements, and that kind of shaped the next, you know, that following decade of my life where I was kind of ten toes, going around giving presentations all over the world, meeting with students, meeting with youth leaders and communities from New Zealand to Australia to Brazil, Latin America, and, and, and Europe. Go to the next slide. And one thing I also realized very early on is I had all these like really powerful teachings about the movements that we were a part of and about our, our potential to, to work within them. And I didn't see that necessarily reflected in how the media or how the, our culture was talking about these issues. In the climate crisis, I mean, first of all, like, raise your hand if you, you have a, you know what, climate changes, if you, if you have an understanding relatively. Cool, great, that makes sense, we're at a sustainability conference. <laughs> I would hope so. Um, it's because, just like a disclaimer, I'm not gonna explain climate change in this presentation. Um, okay, now, would you raise your hand if the information or the content that you have seen around climate change has felt compelling, personally compelling to you? Anybody? That's impressive. That's impressive. Um, because when I was getting into this for the first time, there was not very much compelling about the way we were talking about the climate crisis. 
So I don't know if y'all are just being nice to whatever documentaries that you watched or news segments that you're seeing. Um, because I think, you know, if, if we're all pretty on the same page about the reality of the climate crisis, like, we're not doing that great. <laughs> and we have a very limited amount of time to dramatically transition our energy economy and keep fossil fuels in the ground. And so when I was, like, coming up in these movements, the spaces were always very predominantly older and, and white. And so, I didn't, first of all, like, I just off rip, I didn't see myself in these spaces. I was always the anomaly. I was like, oh, it's so cute. You're out here like you're a little kid. And to be fair, I was really cute, and I was really little. When I was started doing all this stuff, I was, like, six years old when I got on stage for the first time to deliver my first little speech, right? Um, so I was really young, but it was also, like, this... Um, I didn't see my peers in these spaces. And I was like, there's something wrong with that. There's something wrong with how we're telling this story. There's something fundamentally flawed with the communication around this crisis where not only are our elected officials failing every single year to take adequate steps towards remediating where we're at, but the public has this like simultaneously existential dread and complacency and apathy and I was like to me it just didn't make sense I was like what are you talking about like then I realized it's because the stories that we tell around this have to change dramatically if we want to engage our generation if we want to engage the people on the planet to build popular power to demand change from our elected officials because as I was learning about all this I would see time and time again one-off actions, beautiful marches. This is from the People's Climate March back in, I believe, 2015, 2015. Some of y'all were there. Y'all remember? Um, yeah, heck yeah. Um, and we would have these, like, powerful moments within the climate movement where everybody would get together and there would be, you know, thousands of people out in the streets. And then that momentum would seem to dissipate. And people would go back to their lives. And, our, and like, there wasn't that same kind of sustained revolutionary power that I saw when I started to learn about revolutionary movements throughout history, when I learned about the American Indian Movement and the Black Panther Party and the EZLN and the Zapatistas in Mexico and these different revolutionary movements that, that fundamentally changed and reshaped the culture. Um, not, only, not always to the extent that we have imagined, but have laid the groundwork and the foundation for justice movements that exist in the world today, right? And I think a big part of this is, you know, there's a lot of incentive to keep things going as there are. We're essentially, you know, have the extinction of our species versus, on one end of the spectrum, versus the most powerful uh, private interests and corporations on the planet on the other side. And money is just really, really powerful. And so as a kid, I was organizing in my community. I, like, started to hear this rhetoric and hear people talk about money in politics and hear people talk about fossil fuel lobbyists. And it all felt very kind of removed. And I was like, oh, this is the same issue with the climate conversation. Like, it's not, people don't feel personally connected to what we're talking about. People don't feel like this is something that is intimately interconnecting with our lives, with our reality. And it wasn't until we started doing a lot of organizing on the grounds in Colorado to resist the expansion of the natural gas industry of the fracking industry across the Front Range. And there were hundreds of thousands of fracking wells that were, that were going up in, in, in my community, right, in, in the surrounding in Colorado. Um, and I was like 11, 12, 13 years old when I started to give presentations to go and teach young people about the realities of, of the natural gas industry, that it's a false solution to climate change, that the methane emitted from these um, natural gas well pads are 70 to 100 times more potent of greenhouse gases versus CO2. Overall, you know, I was like, I had the whole presentation on lock. Like, there was the crazy stats, but also me and my brother would perform as well to start to engage the students. Um, and it's, the wildest thing happened kind of as a result of that is one of the schools that we went to speak at, we gave this presentation talking about fracking, talking about the health impacts it was having on the communities, how kids were getting sick across the front range. And one of the parents of one of the students worked in the fossil fuel industry. And uh, we had this whole debacle that kind of popped up out of it, right, where all these, like, articles were written and, like, oh, these parents were outraged that we were out there kind of informing and educating the community uh, from our perspective. And I think teachers got fired. Like, it was really serious. 
And from there, we actually got like death threats from the fossil fuel industry. I was 13 at the time. My brother was 11. This is how seriously they're playing, right? Any threat to the power and to the accumulation of wealth and to the chokehold that they have on our economy and uh, our communities is, is met with this kind of backlash. And at the same time, we had, you know, Obama was, was the president back when we were kind of fighting a lot of this. And we had, um, you know, a Democrat in office. There was, there was Congress, uh, there was a governor, excuse me, his name was Governor Hickenlooper. And we saw there was basically no chance of getting fossil fuel restrictions placed at a state level. And so six different municipalities, six different cities across Colorado mobilized and organized their communities to ban fracking to outright ban or to create stronger restrictions to keep it away from our schools, away from our communities, away from our homes. And Governor Hickenlooper, who was supposedly a you know, like progressive, green, environmentally conscious Democrat, went and overturned every single ruling, and he sued every community that filed these motions to, to overturn the natural gas industry. So like at that point, I was, I was like 13 years old, 12, 13 years old, and I saw how regardless of political affiliation, money and politics is going to result in the continued destruction of our communities and our planet. And another like, beautiful thing that I learned from this movement is I saw coalitions of people who are not alike coming together to resist the expansion of fracking, which is really, really important. Because we would go out to the suburbs to these like predominantly affluent white communities and we would have people standing in solidarity with many folks from more marginalized black and brown communities who were being impacted at a similar rate because we're all sharing the same airshed. And all of a sudden, it wasn't so much about science or what we believe. There wasn't so much like pettiness around the logistics of, of what it is that we were fighting for. It wasn't a social cause. It wasn't a, um, even a, a, a political topic as much as it was like, this is about the survival of our community, about the well-being of our children. And I think indigenous movements, indigenous people resisting the expansion of, of, of fossil fuel extraction across the country, when we're up, when we face things like fracking or like pipelines being built in our communities, we face um, the violence of the climate crisis. As indigenous peoples, there's this framing and this understanding of this as a threat to our cultural survival. Because for the last 500 years, we've been battling uphill to maintain our languages, to maintain our, our spiritual practices, to reclaim and relearn and reteach much of what has been taken from us over the last 500 years of erasure, assimilation, and genocide. And so when we talk about the climate crisis for a lot of indigenous communities, and again, this is me speaking from my experience. I don't really speak for anybody. I don't really speak for all Native peoples by any means. But from what I've learned from other movement leaders and organizers is that there is this shared understanding that the climate crisis is an extension of the colonization of, of, of this continent. That these extractive industries are doing nothing but continuing to perpetuate the same violence that has been done unto our people for the last 500 years. This is a new front line for us. And for a lot of non-native communities and non-native folks, the climate crisis is also a threat to our cultural survival. It's not contingent on, you know, our, uh, what community we live in or, or you know, our, even our socioeconomic status. Like, so the climate crisis fundamentally challenges everything about our potential to continue to exist on the planet. And so sustaining human life has a lot more to do with the ways in which the climate crisis is not just an environmental issue. We've done a really good job of ingraining this idea through the rhetoric that has been kind of popularly accepted around the climate crisis, that it's an environmental issue. It's a progressive issue. Uh, it's an issue that, that mostly white people are, are thinking about or, or, or active around. And I think it's because we have, as a movement, not had enough critical conversations about how the climate ties into every other social movement and every other social issue from redlining to voter fraud and voter disenfranchisement to 
women's reproductive health to gender and, and sexuality to racial justice and indigenous sovereignty, like every single one of these, these topics which are, are big and heavy and complicated on their own, they're all touched by the climate crisis. The, the continued destabilization of our climate threatens all of our abilities to exist, to have our communities be in peaceful relationships with each other and with the world. The next slide. And, all, and a lot of this started to click for me when I began to organize and do more work with different indigenous sovereignty movements, with different indigenous liberation movements, working with different native-led organizations to address the climate crisis. And, you know, the, the Keystone XL pipeline was the first fight that, that I really saw. I was like, yeah, maybe the original actions that were happening around KXL, it was probably like 2013. I was 13 years old and I saw, for the first time, a room full of indigenous people leading these kind of actions in ceremony, in prayer, with their songs, with their cultural identity first, like front and center, with how they were relating to and communicating this issue. And there was, a, there was a different level of power there, right? It wasn't people signing up for an after-school program to talk about sustainability. It wasn't kind of a debate around, you know, transitioning my, putting solar panels on my house and, like, turning off the water when we wash our hands and biking to school. No, like, for the way that you saw indigenous people interact with the climate crisis and with the, these conversations was so um, profoundly personal. And, and the stories and the ways in which it was told and, and communicated for me were so inspiring and so kind of offered this glue, right, to all these different kind of pieces that I was learning as I was traveling, as I was going to colleges, as I was invited to speak at the United Nations. I would see all these small pieces. And I think this, this viewpoint of interconnectedness and of cultural survival is, is part of, like, the compass that has, the last, that has led the last many years of, of my work and of my organizing. And I think we have reached a really interesting point in our history over the last couple of years between the pandemic and the movement for black lives and the uprisings, these kind of racial justice reckonings that have happened across the country where we are being forced as a culture, as a country to understand how interconnected these conversations are, how interconnected these issues are, how interconnected our communities are. And that fundamentally, this conversation around colonization and around white supremacy and around these different violent systems that have architected the, the country that we live within have to be understood in order for us to effectively organize to build a safer, more healthier, just future for the next generation. Because if you look historically, too, at every kind of major conflict that is that is popped up across the United States, I think fundamentally, like our relationship to land is something that we have to recognize is at the root of a lot of these things. And during the uprisings, I was living in Philly at the time, and there was this beautiful kind of summer of of solidarity, right, where there was a lot of protest movements in the streets, um, calling for justice for for the family of George Floyd and the many unarmed black relatives whose lives were taken at the hands of police violence, at the hands of a system that over-polices black and brown communities. And those conversations were not isolated to being a black issue, but the ways in which I witnessed indigenous resistance movements also recognizing the need to both show up for our black relatives in solidarity, to be there to understand that since the beginning of, of, this, of this country's inception, our struggles have been deeply interconnected. And seeing how this greater awareness around racial justice has served all of our communities to make advances into the future. And seeing how indigenous liberation movements as well have been kind of fighting our way to, to gain recognition and gain this, this um, kind of prevalence in, in pop culture and in mainstream culture for people to understand these things as being in, like deeply interconnected with every other social issue that we talk about. And like that summer, you, you could see this, this um, kind of this wave, this wave of, of people having deep critical conversations and within the climate movement as well, within a lot of these, you know, white-led nonprofits oftentimes about saying, 
when we say climate justice, when we talk about addressing the climate crisis, we can't just talk about pivoting from one energy source to another energy source with the, with the majority of the power and the benefits continuing to go to big energy companies. We have to think about what a just transition looks like, what a just transition can look like. This centers frontline communities. This centers the black, brown, and indigenous communities who have been pushed to the sidelines, pushed to the margins, who have been neglected and haven't had access to the resources that they need to, from access to clean water, to access to energy, to access to economic development. The, the climate crisis really is this massive existential threat to all life on Earth. But it is also an opportunity. It's an invitation for us as humanity to reimagine our relationship with our people, to reimagine our relationship to wealth, to reimagine our relationship to the land. And I think there is so much to be learned from, from a framework when we talk about climate change, when we talk about climate justice, I think the censoring of indigenous communities, the censoring of frontline communities, the censoring of the voices of black and brown peoples is fundamental, regardless of who we are or, or what our racial background is. Because these communities have been at the forefront of this longer than anybody. We've been actively fighting environmental racism and our communities being put as sacrifice zones for extractive industries, for toxic industries, for generations. And now when we look at what does the future look like, what can we build from here, where are we going, those conversations are the ones that give me the most hope. Go two slides forward. And I have lived a very eclectic life, I think you would say. Um, and I've been blessed with a lot of opportunities to share these messages and share these stories. And one thing that has become a fundamental truth in how I see the world and how I see myself, how I see my, my voice and my relationship to these movements, which has changed a lot. I was like six years old when I started this. I'm 22, like I'm a young adult. And over the last, you know, 16 years of my involvement in the climate movement, I've seen a lot of things. And I've seen consecutively over the last 16 years, our political leaders fail again and again to represent and actuate the change that is so deeply needed that the science so clearly points to. And at the same time, I've seen the momentum that is built and the power that we generate as communities when we mobilize, when we organize together, when we build in solidarity with one another. I think the pandemic exemplified so much of the social and cultural dysfunction that we see in our society, in our world. I think it was very, very evident that many of the, the, the systems that are put into place, they don't prioritize or care about our lives. They don't prioritize or care about the well-being of our communities. Many of these institutions from medical to, to educational, their priority isn't for the well-being of especially poor black, brown, and indigenous peoples. And in the pandemic, we didn't see government stepping up to protect and provide aid and provide support, provide relief when people couldn't pay their bills, when people couldn't afford their rent. The momentum and the power of that moment over the last couple of years has been generated from people organizing within our communities, building networks of mutual aid, supporting one another, organizing rent strikes, organizing to realize that, that this, this country we live in, the wealthiest country in the world, that spends trillions of dollars on the military, that spends billions of dollars on, on investing in fossil fuel subsidies so that these corporations can continue to be profitable. They will have left us behind. But we won't leave each other behind. We refuse to leave each other behind. We refuse to create a future that doesn't include bringing all of us with us, all of us together into the future. And I didn't learn that from a climate scientist or uh, really anybody who's talking about climate. I learned that from studying social movements, other social justice movements on social media, seeing how people are responding to these incredibly volatile moments that we are in. These incredibly, oftentimes depressing and disheartening and heavy moments over the last many years, and we've had a lot of them. We lost a lot of good people. We lost a lot of amazing organizers. We've lost a lot of leaders. And at the same time, someone like me being on a stage 
isn't inherently transformative or isn't inherently going to bring us the change that we need. But it's y'all, it's the students, it's the next generation of leaders who have just as much of a stake in where the world goes as I do and have just as much power to affect change by organizing our communities. And there's great lists of these, this, and these things that we can do to make our individual footprint lighter on the planet. And, you know, back in the day, Earth Guardians, we had the list of 50 simple things you can do in your lives to reduce your carbon footprint. Um, and that's cool. I think that's, that's important. Understanding, I think that's a, that's, a, that's a first step into understanding our power as individuals. That's the value of that. And beyond that, the work begins with how we organize and how we mobilize and build together towards the world that we know is possible, towards the uncomfortable conversations and the intersections that we're not comfortable working within that we have to deeply commit ourselves to if we're going to survive this. I think a lot of that has to do with organizing from a place of doing what we love, from understanding that leadership looks different to different people, The sharing our light and being a part of shaping the future isn't linear, it isn't uniform. There's many stereotypes around being an activist that were placed upon me my entire, you know, you can imagine being in the spotlight at a young age, like everybody has an opinion and idea of who I am and how I should do what I do and what my message should be. And, um, and like, not, like honestly, none of it holds any weight next to you stepping into your power and doing what you love. And sharing, sharing your truth from a place of that. So that's where we're the most effective. That's where the most, we're the most powerful. Whether that's as a public speaker, an organizer, a teacher, an artist, a storyteller, a journalist, like whatever industry or space lights you up, like that is your pathway into doing this work. It can be one of the most, I think, powerful ways you can transform your workplaces. You can transform through the conversations you have with your family. And for me, over the last, you know, many years, as I've been doing a lot of this activism, I've been developing and finding and sharing my voice as an artist as well. And I found that, you know, I've given TED Talks and I've spoken at the UN and I've spoken at, I don't know, about hundreds at this point, maybe several dozens of colleges over the course of my short life. And nothing compares to the experience and the feeling that I have when I'm on stage performing. When a lot of these same ideas and same messages, the same energy is being delivered from the stage, but when I'm doing it through my music and through my art, it really, like, I just feel so alive doing that. And then I, you can understand how music is this, this conduit and this, this, this message and this um, medium that translates and communicates to people in such a different way than being up on a stage and, and talking or delivering a keynote speech, not to say that it's not important. I'm grateful that I have this, this outlet as well. But the discovery that I've made as I've traveled to communities everywhere, it's like young people, the doorway into this work, the doorway into these movements doesn't necessarily happen, isn't necessarily opened up by the science and the information and a lot of the like truly kind of depressing, fear-based uh, stories that, that are really kind of pushed onto our generation. But when young people can tell our own stories, not just about the reality of the climate crisis or making a TikTok about climate science or whatever, but when we tell our own stories about what we believe the future can be, that's when I've seen young people light up at the possibility of what there is. And trust me, I think about this stuff all the time. And the only way I've been able to maintain a sense of hope, a sense of belief in our, in our power to overcome is because I get to come to places like this where a lot of like-minded young people get to gather in these spaces. And the conversations that I have afterwards, understanding and learning about the work that is being done within these communities of how young people are organizing and mobilizing and building solidarity and showing up for one another, those are the conversations that have kept me afloat throughout the last many years of, of me doing this work. The next slide. And one of the projects that has been really inspiring for me to lean into is really looking at what, is it, what does it mean to return land to indigenous people? What does it mean to give land back? What does that look like? What are the, what are the, the models that we can look to that demonstrate? What, what impact does that have on, on the climate? And I think 2021, 2020, 2021, 
the Indigenous Environmental Network put out this phenomenal study. And if you're into reading papers and studies and, and um, more academic works of that sort, I really recommend that you look into this. The Indigenous Environmental Network, which is this really um, kind of established, credible uh, coalition of indigenous organizers and scientists and storytellers, they put together this study to quantify how much carbon emissions indigenous resistance basically stops from being emitted to the atmosphere, right? So it looked at the last decade, and it looked at indigenous resistance movements from the Keystone XL pipeline to the Dakota Access Pipeline and the Standing Rock movement to Bayou Bridge to many of these movements for indigenous people to protect and to stop uh, the expansion of fossil fuel infrastructure to protect their lands, to return lands into their hands. And indigenous organizing over the last decade has either um, delayed or stopped a quarter of the U.S. and Canada's carbon emissions over the last decade. Right? Because si like science will tell us, we like fundamentally, if we want to survive this, you have to keep fossil fuels in the ground. Period. That's like one of the one of the two or three absolute musts that are on most, I think, comprehensive lists of what needs to be done to stop the climate crisis. And indigenous people for the last several decades have been at the forefront of that, at the forefront of fighting to keep fossil fuels in the ground. Uh, if if it weren't for indigenous organizers in 2012, 2013, all the way up into the last couple years. The Keystone XL pipeline would have been built and have crude oil flowing through it. It would have been detrimental to our climate, to the carbon emissions rising even further. And when I came across this study, it's like, in my heart, I always, you know, like, I know that indigenous resistance is a key ingredient of, of delivering us the future that we know is possible. But you see this study and you quantify it. You see the numbers of how much indigenous people being in control and having autonomy over how our lands are developed, if they are developed. That is like one of the, the, the cornerstones to the climate justice that we want to see over the next many decades. Um, and so this conversation of, around land back, I wrote this song um, and built this whole beautiful campaign and brought together a bunch of different amazing indigenous artists to illustrate this, this, this message of, of take it all back of taking back and returning lands to indigenous people. And we put up a, a two-story billboard in downtown Portland, which is one of the whitest kind of urban cities in the country, to reclaim space and to think about art, right? When you think about music, you think about songs, you think about art, how do we creatively engage in tactics to challenge the imagination of regular people, of everyday people, people walking down the street? Nothing is going to progress unless we are brave enough to imagine an alternative to what the world is, right? So how do we tell stories? How do we make compelling artwork that invite people to be a part of these conversations? So we, there was this whole beautiful rollout of this campaign where we shot this amazing music video. We had this amazing narration from different Lakota artists, um, footage of, of this powerful protest that happened um, when Trump was trying to bring his, his people down to uh, the, the sacred Black Hills of South Dakota to Mount Rushmore to do like a 4th of July thing back in 2020, I believe. And all these indigenous organizers that resisted and put a blockade up and basically, you know, uh, many of them were arrested, many of them were taken away, but it was this, this powerful demonstration of, of protecting and, and preserving our lands from this already desecration, which is Mount Rushmore. And then, you know, this, this, this president whose rhetoric and whose policies have can only con contributed to the continued erasure and, and violence towards indigenous peoples. And so we had this beautiful campaign laid out, this music video, this song, and this artwork that, that was taking up space not only in Portland, but we invited people anywhere and everywhere to download the art and wheat paste it in their cities. And we had over a dozen cities across the U.S. People were putting this artwork up, and everything had a link and, and, and basically a connection and an integration back into people understanding and what this land back movement is and what the conversation towards land back is and how... Being a part of this return of lands to indigenous people is, is, is paramount for, for building a, a future in a world that, that exists in balance, that continues to bring us closer to, to what we know is possible.
And so for me, it's like as, as an artist and as a storyteller and as, as a spokesperson, it's like these are the kinds of things that we need to begin to invest in when it comes to the storytelling around the crisis, around this climate crisis, if we want to pull ourselves out of the depths that we are in. Because the time is really running out. Last slide. And I think we effectively create change in the world when we organize and we build and we move from a place of love. When we understand that what is at stake right now is everything that we hold dear to us, everything that we love. Culture, our food, our language, our relationship to our family, our lineage, all the light that humanity has brought into the world, all the art that has been brought to life, the complexity and, and, and the honest, innocent beauty that exists amidst the darkness of, <laughs> of humanity. Our relationship to our children, to our grandchildren, to our nieces and nephews, to our siblings, to our relatives. That is all kind of what is at stake when we talk about the climate crisis. And building through that, for me, has been just constantly reminding myself that this work has to be grounded in a reminder of, of doing what we love and fighting for what we love. And this photo was taken at the climate strike in New York in September 2019. And it was one of the most powerful moments I ever experienced because I've been to a lot of protests, I've been to a lot of climate events, I've been to a lot of symposiums and seminars and conferences and, and gatherings. And this was the first time that you step out onto the streets of New York, they, they let out, all, all of New York public schools let out school that day because they knew people were gonna walk out anyways. And so that was, a cool, that was a cool demonstration of solidarity from, like, you know, the, 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 the school staff and the, the Board of Education and everything. And I, like, you step, onto the, you step out of the subway. You're already, like, surrounded by, by young people. And I step onto the streets, and it was the first time that I look around. I was 19 at the time. And everybody was younger than me. And I was like, what are you talking about? I'm supposed to, like, I'm usually the youngest person kind of in these spaces. That first show, photo that I showed of, of that March back in 2015, I was definitely still one of the youngest people. It was like a lot of people in their, like, early, mid-20s, a lot of college-age students. And I pulled up to this, this walkout, and it was just this ocean of young people, of, like, regular kids. Regular. I just mean, like, everyday American teenagers who were out and about and who... who like coalesced, there was like hundreds of thousands of students marching through the streets of New York. And it reminded me that the power that we have does not lie in individual leaders. Because I think after this moment, we've kind of, as a climate movement, got caught up with a little bit of this like climate celebrity. Um, and, and, and I've been, you know, for sure a part of that throughout my life, right, of putting a lot of emphasis on individual leaders that we lift up and prop up. And, and it's cool, like having leader, having people that we look up to, having people that we that we learn from, having people that are that are role models. It's really important, especially for young people. But power doesn't come from one person being on a stage talking to many. The power of that moment was the collective action and energy and electricity that was experienced in those streets. This mass mobilization of of youth. And you know, the pandemic stifled a lot of this momentum, this ability for us to gather in person, this ability to look each other in the eyes and hear each other's voices and, and listen to, to each other's perspectives and, and organize and gather and continue to build momentum. But I will tell you that our generation is better positioned than any generation that has ever come before us to lead the way. And that does not let the adults in this room off the hook. Because the foundation of, of, of everything we're facing, you know, happened generations before we were even alive, right? So as much as the, 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 the movement must be youth-led, it also must be intergenerational. And everybody has a part to play. And the only difference between myself and like any other student in the world or young person in the world is, is I had the space, the ingredients, the, 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 the role models and the, the environment that nurtured me to speak my truth and to share my voice. And I think if there's anything we, we look, about, look at when we, when we think about how do we build a more just world, it's like we need to create those spaces for our youth. That means having spaces to talk about and process, you know, many of the mental health issues that are plaguing our generation. That means having safe and healing spaces for young people to process 
generational trauma, especially coming from black, brown, and indigenous communities. These things are not removed from us being leaders in our society. Being leaders in our community means having healthy relationships with our adults, with our elders, having strong relationships with our community. And so I think fundamentally my, my belief is that our way forward, our way out of this catastrophe is through our relationships, the depth of our relationships, not just the critical masses and the critical numbers of people that we can gather at a moment's notice when the energy is right. But it's like, how deep do these relationships go? Because if the relationships are deep, even if it's less people, we will show up again and again and again until our liberation is won. And we have a lot on our shoulders, but there is just as much light and hope that I have for the future. And we all have a part to play in that. And I'm grateful to be here, alive at this time, at this incredibly complicated and tumultuous time in our world's history, to play a small part, just like we all must, to deliver a brighter, more just, healthy, sustainable, interconnected, and intersectional world for those that will follow. And the wave is coming. And part of the reason that there are this many young people in the streets is because our generation is challenging these kind of traditional narratives around climate justice or environmental activism or sustainability to say climate justice means racial justice. Climate justice means land back. Climate justice means reparations for our black relatives. Climate justice means building a world where we don't continue to exploit frontline communities for the benefit of few and where we can all work together to build the future we know is possible. Thank you. Oh, shoot, Tess Scott, thank you so much. That was so powerful. Um, I Let's give one more big round of applause for Shoot, Tess Scott. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, at this time, we'll move into the Q&A portion. Um, so uh, please um, think of your questions. If you see beside me, um, just pull out your devices, and you can go to slido.com in your internet browser and put in the codes, and you can send a message to um, a question uh, to Shitesca. And of course, um, I'm really proud to say right now um, that we have uh, over 550 people live streaming this event right now. Yes. <laughs> So um, so we won't be able to get to all the questions because they're going to be sending in their questions as well. But please send them in, um, and we will get them to Shetesca. And, we, and we've got about 15 minutes right now to ask them as, as many as possible. So, yes, wonderful. Well, um, uh, please, here, would you like to have a seat? And we'll get started. So, yeah, please take a few minutes to send in your questions, and we'll get started soon. <laughs> this is my first, like, uh, what's it called, like, um, fusion Q&A, doing, like, got the audience here in person, but we're also doing it on the app. If y'all figure it out, like, I'm impressed. Like, I know there's a lot of, like, adults and, and you know, elders in, in the building, and a lot of, and I mean that in the most respectful way, like, my, uh, Nah, we, like, you respect your elders or else, like, that's <laughs> crucial. So all to say, like, if, if you guys can't figure out, no, no worries. Um, and I'm impressed if you do. Like, I know my mom will be struggling probably right now. Actually, no, my mom's good with it. My dad probably would have a harder time right now. <laughs> Take your time. Okay. So we've got, we've got some coming in already, so let's go ahead and get started. I want to get to as many as we can. I know 15 minutes is going to fly by. So yes. first question is, um, about your name, mm -hmm. can you please explain, does your name have meaning? Where did it come from? How did you get your name? <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's an important question. Um, my name is Shiu Tescat Donatiu, and I was given that name. Um, in, our, in our culture, we, we have basically a, our people are, are very skilled astronomers. That's like a, a really important part of, you know, our, our cultural heritage. Um, and so the names that we give our children traditionally is by reading the Tonalamak, which is this like celestial reading of what the sky is doing when the baby is born. So you get the time, the day, everything. And then the elders go and kind of take that information. They look at what the sky was doing, and then they boil it down to 
like two different names, two or three different names that reflect the life path of that child. Um, and so that, that's how I was given my name in a ceremony in, in the Black Hills of South Dakota from uh, elders from my community as well as, as a chief of a looking horse and elders from the Lakota community who were there as well. Um, and yeah, so that's, that's a big part of who I am and how I move through the world. And, and the translation is, is turquoise mirror, Shiu Tescat, turquoise mirror. And my second name, Donatiu, is the sun, um, which is kind of like a reflection of, of the sky on the ocean kind of vibe. But yeah, thank you. Well, do you mind if we all say it with you, your name? Please. I know it took me a few weeks. Um, I've had an advantage over everyone else because I've had a chance to practice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I Y'all got it. Okay. If everyone... It's harder to spell than it is to say, I would say. So it's pronounced Shu Tezkat. Okay. Shu Tezkat. Yes. Let's say one more time. Like that. Shu Tezkat. Beautiful. I'm sure everybody at home tuning in live is saying it to themselves and their cat too. So yeah. appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you so much. And what a beautiful name. Thank you. All right, next question. Um, you talked about how people don't believe their voice or their part matters in the climate uh, conversation. Sure. Uh, we hear the same thing when young people talk about how their, um, how their uh, voice doesn't matter when talking about voting. Mm. Um, their vote doesn't matter because, you know, the machine or the man mm -hmm. um, is in control of everything. How do we convert this apathy into action? I don't blame y'all. Like, it's, it's, um, it's really disheartening. Politics is really disheartening. Voting is really disheartening, even for, for myself. And um, I, was a, I was a surrogate for the Bernie Sanders campaign back in 2020. Um, and I, it was so beautiful to be a part of this kind of wave within politics that... Um, I don't know, I, I, was, I was speaking at colleges across California with, with other students kind of talking about this movement that he represented. And I think electoral politics is, is the toxicity of it really comes from, I think, a couple of things. Like one, the, the money in politics, you know, that our elected officials are just bought and sold based on the highest bidder, based on the most campaign donations coming in from one industry or another. And like the climate movement, like our nonprofits can't compete with Exxon and with shell and with big pharma and like we like there's just no way um to ensure that you know we can have a horse in that race and so you can't really trust you know politicians to be altruistic in, in a lot of ways because of how the system is structured and, and so I, I put so much excitement and belief that you know the bernie sanders campaign had had formed not only you know this momentum around a politician or an individual elected official but around this idea and this movement um to, to, to mobilize masses of, of people to, to talk about these like popular issues like the climate crisis. And I had a lot of hope at the same time when, when Obama was elected in 2008 too, that his rhetoric around addressing the climate change, uh, the, the climate crisis, he would live up to that. And instead I saw him fast track fossil fuel development, offshore oil drilling. I saw him open up public lands across the country to more fossil fuel infrastructure development. I saw him speak on natural gas extraction, which directly impacts my community, speak on that as if it was a solution or a bridge fuel that still put people like myself and my siblings, my family in the sacrifice zone, um, rather than being able to, to pivot to 100% renewable energy. And, you know, I told the story earlier of Governor Hickenlooper too. So, so just, just to like, to be really candid with y'all, because I'm not here to, you know, put up any kind of charade. Like, <laughs> I'm, very, I'm very real and transparent. Um, it is disheartening. And it is hard to believe that, that our votes can matter, especially with the Electoral College, especially with these different kind of barriers to us experiencing an actual democracy. Um, and what I would say to, to that point, they count on us and those who are invested in the destruction of our planet and of our communities are very invested in young people not believing in our voices not believing in our votes, not believing in the power that we have. They're very invested. I mean, that's why there is a, a like full-scale attack happening on, on access to, to voting, to, to true access to voting rights, especially in black and brown communities, um, because they don't want us to be determining where our future lies. And so there's, there's things to be said about the ele elected officials, the politicians that are running for office, many of them in this endless cycle of just raising money and, and trying to get reelected. But at the same time, like there is, there is so much power that our generation has when we mobilize. 
And I think it's a matter of like, we just need to raise our standards in a lot of way because like the people that we are like, that the, that the world is calling on us to fight for to get into office, they're not doing what it takes to transform our economy and our country as quickly as we need to. And so things are really dire. The midterm elections are important. I think voting is a tool. I think just, th just, just think, it's like really just that simple. It is one tool in your tool bag as a, as a leader, as an organizer, as, a, as an engaged citizen to be a part of creating change. And like we have to prove those that are invested in our downfall wrong by showing up, by showing up in our communities, voting similar to, you know, recycling or, or like making small changes in our everyday lives. Like it's not for many of us that have access to it. Like you, we absolutely should be voting because it's from, from a lot of us, it's not that hard, you know, and, and then advocating for those who it is difficult for um, and, and understanding this as one step of many to creating transformative change. Voting alone won't necessarily bring us the justice that we need, but it is a part to play that, that we, I think, have a responsibility to, to tap in with to a degree. Thank you. Yeah, that's a long answer. Sorry, I have a lot of feelings about that. I'm like still recovering from 2020. <laughs> <laughs> Aren't we all? Aren't we all? <laughs> Thank you. Well, along with that, there's several people that are asking um, if you're not of voting age, our youth, how can they yes. get involved? How can they make a difference? No, most of my career in this like career, most of my lifetime doing community organizing has been as a non-voting citizen. Um, and so for, for the longest time, I think... Um, my message to other students, to other high school students, elementary, middle school, like everybody I was talking to, really relied on, on you know, engaging in our community um, and building community, building solidarity. I think that's, that's one of the most valuable things that I've learned from this is the relationships I've, I've, I've cultivated along the way, the people that I've met, the people that I've connected with. Um, this work is really depressing if you're in it alone. And that's the thing, like, you, you never have to be, you know, like, I think... For many of us are more isolated, whether it's like the community we're in. I know we're out here in Texas, so like I think oftentimes some of these ideas can feel like we're in, we're in a bubble far away from other people who believe in climate justice or believe that we need to, you know, play a part in shaping our community for the better or in sustainability or, or however. But I, I really think that there's so much power when we are able to build community. And that, that starts small, right? That starts with the conversations we have with our friends and family, with our peers, uh, with how we leverage the existing infrastructure that is at our college and universities. How do we push faculty? How do we push the envelope a little bit beyond what is kind of already taking place and take advantage of the resources that, that exist to have our voices heard? And, and again, like really, like I think for, for all y'all out here who aren't of voting age, like it doesn't always have to be a traditional, you know, stereotype of activism that, that dictates your engagement in these movements. Like, no, it can be can be whatever like calls you to, to tap in that's that's how your your voice will be the most impactful and meaningful um, is if you kind of organize from this place of, of, of doing what you love and you know for a long time I work with different nonprofits and different organizations and have specific ways to, to, to direct people but you know there's the internet is is rife with or I don't even know if that's a word the, the, is is bountiful with so much like information and tools and knowledge and so like tap in ask questions learn and like anything I, that, that we have access to, you know, we can, we can leverage to help build power. And I think one of the most valuable lessons I've been learning the last couple of years is like, don't stop learning. Don't stop informing yourself about these issues. Like education is so crucial and a lot of it feels so boring, especially like when I was growing up, a lot of the rhetoric and the books around climate were so dense and like inaccessible to me. But I think there's more and more authors and storytellers and people who are talking about these issues in ways that are so, uh, I don't know, like, refreshing and I think just like to like shameless plug like I published a, and I'm only plugging this because I genuinely think it's a helpful entry point for a lot of students who want to go deeper on some of these issues it's a book that's like 70 pages long it's a tiny little pocket book it's called imaginary borders and it's a book I published in 2019 and it is a very kind of concise and transparent reflection of, of my time kind of organizing and, and, and some of the barriers that I think that we all are experiencing as far as being able to engage and be a part of these movements really from the perspective of like a 19 year old kid I was like 18 19 when I wrote it um, so I think that's that's a good entry point and from there there's like a lot of other places you can go and more literature you can read and um, more you can study and learn and documentaries and podcasts like it goes really deep so I think finding an entry point and informing yourself and building community those are like the, the foundation um, foundationary steps and I think if you're here already if you're tapping the live stream like that's that's a great first step you know
Thank you. And please plug away. Let's see, what's the name of your book again and where can we find it? Titled Imaginary Borders um, by Shutesca Martinez. And you can, it's on Amazon. I think a lot of local bookstores also have it. Um, Barnes and Nobles. And there's an audiobook version of it as well, which I narrated, thankfully. The book I published like a long time ago, I didn't narrate it. And I heard the voice of the dude and I was like, bro, are you serious? <laughs> He was just mispronouncing my own name and everything, and I was like, oh, that's, and it's nobody's fault but my own. Like, I just, I didn't, I didn't make sure that I was the voice. So this other one is my voice. Um, so rest assured. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, let's, um, uh, we've got, oh gosh, we've got about five more minutes, so we, let's try to get to two yeah, more questions. Um, they're coming in, but I'll make sure to get all of these to you. Um, so uh, next question. So how can, for those of us that are not indigenous, how can we be a strong ally for indigenous peoples? So this is an app that everybody should download on their phones called Native Lands. And feel free to, like, do it right now. If you want, um, if you know how to work the app store, if you don't, it's all it's all good. You can have your. I'm I'm not saying that you don't. I'm just saying like there's no shame in that being a barrier to your to your allyship. Like it's okay. Like that's why we're here. That's why all these conversations are happening. Um, but if you would like to right now, a great a great app to download is Native Lands, and it should be good for Android and iOS, Apple, whatever whatever people say when they're like on all downloading platforms. Um, and that is, I, I think, just like fundamentally where we stand, where we go to school, where we go to work every day, where we live, where we grow up. Like that is, I think, such an entry point for understanding how actually every day we are interacting with indigenous land, with land that is traditionally stewarded, owned, cultivated, that has a whole spiritual philosophy in, in, a, in a politics that existed on this land long before any of us were here. Like, I think st starting with where we stand, where we live, where we are. Anybody taps in from anywhere, like anybody who goes to school or lives far away from where they're going to school, like download this app and you can type in any city in the country, any, any place where you live or any place where your family's from, and it gives you kind of a, 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 a base layer of, of information around like whose land are you on? I think that's like the opening conversation. Whose land are you on? And from there how do you engage effectively with students who are from that place? And, and I, I consult with different corporations and different boards and different stuff, and I'm telling people the same thing every time. It's like those relationships are so crucial. As a school, what is being done to help ensure that indigenous voices are included in conversations around sustainability? And I, I know oftentimes it's, it's difficult. There's not always you know, large representation of bodies of indigenous students at schools. Um, and a lot of major cities have pushed indigenous people out and have displaced indigenous people from their communities. And at the same time, most urban cities are also a gathering point from native folks from many different places. So while the formation of indigeneity might look very different than like, there's not a reservation next to every city or in Dallas, there are kind of different ways that we can understand a, a, a healthier, more holistic relationship with the people whose lands that we are on. And I think that question of whose land are you on is an important first step to answer and then think about what, is, what does it look like from there um, to deepen that, that relationship, that the work that you do in your lives, the organizing that you do, how do you include them as indigenous peoples, as stakeholders, um, and, and learn. Like, there's so many dope indigenous content creators, um, artists, storytellers, activists, nonprofit organizations that are doing incredible work that is literally, like, averting and lengthening the, the time that we have to survive the climate crisis. So go online and, like, do your research. You know, I think there's... Just look it up and you'll find all kinds of cool lists. Now more people in the mainstream are writing about it. Go watch Reservation Dogs. That's a sick show on Hulu. Like, if you haven't seen it yet, it's about our, our, our folks over in, the, in Oklahoma, you know, our um, um, creek folks out there. And it's, it's dope. It's, it's a dope show, right? So the visibility and, and challenging the stereotypes that we have in our mind about indigenous people. Like, I'm indigenous, but I'm, I'm not like a Native American, like North American Indian. Like, I'm, my people are from Mexico. So indigeneity is actually a lot more complicated and expansive, too, than just, like, Hollywood's portrayal of a Plains Indian that is oftentimes portrayed in, in pop culture and in media. So um, all these things are, are good, good first steps. Well, thank you so much. So I'll end it with um, how, how can we follow you on social media, um, contact you if we need to, just, yeah, yeah how, how can we stay up to date on what you're doing? Absolutely. No, I, I'm, I'm very excited this next year, next couple of years. I have a lot of amazing projects that I'm... Um, very excited about building curriculum and working with students and, and kind of at the, the intersection of art, culture, 
indigenous sovereignty, climate justice, um, as well as, as my art and my music. I'm going to be touring again next year and playing shows across the country um, and putting out another album. So there's, there's a lot. There's a lot kind of coming up for me, potentially writing and publishing another book. Um, and everything you can find at um, my social media links, and it's all just my name, Shoot Ted Scott. Um, and it's on the poster outside. They, they've got a little, uh, you know, you find me if you, if you look at the event information. But, yeah, just my first name. That's where you can find me on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, my website, shootescott.com. Reach out. I'm speaking at universities across the country over the next few months as well, doing a little bit of that in between my other work as well. So honored to be here. Again, it's like my first time back with, like, a, a live studio audience. Um, it's cool. It's great to be here with you all, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.